Good evening, everyone. I want to start by saying a very special thank you to all of you for taking time away from the Rangers game and <laughs> all of your other valuable activities to spend some time doing something special um, that, to my mind, goes to the heart of what um, the mission of our university is, which is to have serious discussions about complicated, controversial topics that um, are about critical inquiry and mutual learning, and not just political warfare as usual. We're here to explore the surprisingly messy but essential question of how best to achieve liberty and justice and prosperity for all. Specifically, which business models, legal rules, cultural norms, ethical norms, and government policies give us the best chance to achieve those three important goals. I'm Dr. Rob Garnett. I'm a professor of economics in the Agron College of Liberal Arts here at TCU. And I have the privilege this semester of co-teaching a class on capitalism and socialism uh, with Dr. Sam Arnold over here from the political science department and 16 outstanding honor students who are scattered throughout this room um, who have bravely signed up for this adventure even though some of them have never had an economics or a political science class before. And so we've been learning a lot on the fly. Our colloquium, it's, it's a university honors colloquium that is uh, an upper division course that honors students from various majors can take, is supported by a generous gift from the namesake of our honors college, Mr. John D. Roach and his Roach Family Foundation. And in 2018, Mr. Roach endowed this course so that TCU honors students could learn the grand visions and the practical problems of capitalism and socialism. Uh, while also gaining greater freedom and confidence to think for themselves about political and economic matters. When he first met with the first cohort, this is the fourth time we've done this, but in January 2021 when we did it for the first time, Mr. Roach challenged our students to, quote, listen carefully, argue passionately, and above all, keep working together to create practical solutions to the complex problems we face. I know Mr. Roach and his family would be gratified to know how many of you have come out this evening to join this conversation. We've invited two distinguished guests to help us think more intelligently about tonight's question, the question of which is better, capitalism or socialism? And like any good final exam prompt, it is a devilishly two-part question. Uh, one, which system is better, but two, by what normative criteria should economic systems be judged as good or bad, better or worse? It's my pleasure to welcome first Dr. Brian Kaplan of George Mason University, where he is Professor of Economics and Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center. Dr. Kaplan is also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, a former contributor to the Freakonomics blog that some of you may be familiar with, and is currently publisher of his own blog, which if you're not familiar with it, you are in the minority, since uh, it has uh, upwards of 9,000 subscribers at the moment. Uh, it is called Bet On It. Uh, Dr. Kaplan holds degrees from two prestigious economics programs. He got his BA at uh, Cal Berkeley in 1993 and a PhD from Princeton in 1997. But he is best known for his iconoclastic applications of economic reasoning to practical questions of public life, such as the myth of the rational voter, why democracies choose bad policies, 2007 Princeton University Press, selfish reasons to have kids, more kids, why being a great parent is less work and more fun than you think, 2011 basic books. And uh, the one that has attracted a lot of attention recently, The Case Against Education, Why the Education System is a Waste of Time and Money. He'd be happy to talk to you about that afterwards. Uh, 2018 Princeton University Press. So please welcome Dr. Brian Kaplan. Not yet. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't set that up right. <laughs> Briefly, I'm also pleased to welcome Dr. Scott Sehan of Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine, where he is the Joseph E. Merrill Professor of Philosophy and Chair of the Philosophy Department, um, and the inspiration for the career of Dr. Sam Arnold, for which I'm ever grateful. Uh, Dr. Sehan also earned his PhD from Princeton University, a strange coincidence, uh, 1994 in philosophy in his case, after completing his undergrad studies as a philosophy major at Harvard. Much of his scholarly work has been dealing with questions that seem far away from capitalism and socialism, 
uh, philosophy of mind, metaphysics, epistemology, philosophy of action, free will. But at some point, perhaps during the pandemic, I'm not sure yet, he started thinking and writing a lot about political philosophy, specifically on questions of capitalism and socialism, culminating in his forthcoming book, which we've been using in our class, Socialism, A Logical Introduction, which will be out early next year from Oxford University Press. So please welcome Dr. Scott Seymour. Our debate will unfold in several stages. The first 60 minutes belong to these two. Each will deliver a 10 minute opening statement. Each will then be given 10 additional minutes to respond to what the other has argued. And each will then get five minutes to close up their argument in whatever way they, they wish. Uh, we will then open the floor to all of you for questions and answers. Uh, and then in the final minutes, we will call the two speakers back up to this podium and ask them to share with us one thing they can take away from their opponent and one essential truth they would like all of us to, to take with us. So we will give each speaker a place of privilege in the order of remarks. Dr. Kaplan will deliver the first opening statement and thus enjoy the first word, and Dr. Sihan will deliver the final closing statement and thus enjoy the last word. So Dr. Kaplan, now. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, including the people who are behind me. Capitalism and socialism, what do the words even mean? I think often people just say, well, capitalism is whatever we have in the United States, and socialism is whatever they had back in the Soviet Union, if any of you guys remember or at least have heard of the Soviet Union. Right, so if we're doing it that way, then I'll say capitalism is at least okay and socialism is terrible. And I'm hoping that my opponent agrees with that. Uh, but uh, it's a lot more helpful we think about capitalism versus socialism as a continuum. So there's a range. And actually, in his forthcoming book, this is what Scott says. So it's good we got that in common. Um, and something along the lines, if when you're doing the labels on the continuum, of uh, the capitalist ideal is the government plays very little role in the economy, and the socialist ideal is the government plays the leading role in the economy. Now, if we're doing it that way, then I'll say capitalism is awesome and socialism is terrible. Um, now, first of all, what is so awesome about the capitalist ideal? Remember, this is not just what we have in the United States. It is a, a possibility. It is a hope. Well, it is a system based upon individual freedom and voluntary consent. You're allowed to do what you want with your own body and your own stuff. If other people want to cooperate with you, they have to persuade you. If you want other people to cooperate with you, you've got to persuade them. Big question, can consent ever really be voluntary if some people just have a lot more to offer than others? And I'm just gonna take a hard line, absolutely. Some people are vastly more attractive than others, but that does nothing to undermine the voluntariness of dating. Under capitalism, people can use their freedom how they choose. They can try to get rich, they can relax, they can help the poor, they can do all three, they can do none of the above. And this idea of society by consent, it seems to me to be such an attractive moral ideal that I am tempted just to say I'm done, but I'm not going to. Because uh, it's a looming doubt. Maybe capitalism is one of those ideals that sounds really great, but is actually a total disaster in practice. All right, so how can we answer the sprawling question of would this even work? Well, I am a social scientist, so I said, well, let's start with what we know. Let's start with systems that we've actually seen. So I'll we'll say, how about if we're wondering how well capitalism, the ideal would work, we start with the most capitalist countries that in fact exist. Then, once we've got that fixed in our mind, we say, all right, well, what would they have to do to actually meet the ideal? Because remember, the United States is capitalist in one sense. You could just say, that's how I'm gonna define it, but it falls short of the ideal in a great many ways. So then we're gonna to need to weigh the probable effects of the main policy reforms necessary to bring the countries into harmony with the ideal. All right, now, by usual rankings, the world's most capitalist countries are actually Hong Kong and Singapore, right? And then other exemplars include the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada. Uh, by world and historic standards, these are all extremely rich and pleasant countries. Uh, this was not true for Hong Kong or Singapore in 1950, but after decades where they were getting top rankings, they became two of the richest and most pleasant countries on Earth. Now, of course, all of these countries still have relatively poor people but there is very little absolute poverty in any of these countries. 
In fact, poor people in these countries have such a nice life that people around the world eagerly immigrate into these countries in order to get hard, low-paid jobs. Uh, the reason is clear. Uh, free markets channel this fundamental human desire to better yourself in socially productive ways. If you can come up with a product that people find attractive at a price that they like, you will get rich. Uh, and this does not just lead to mountains of cheap and, you know, of cheap and amazing products, it also gives us constant innovation, a ceaseless effort to do more with less. Now obviously most of us are not huge successes in business, but since business is competing for customers and workers, most of the benefits do ultimately go to us. Think about Amazon, it is the best store in human history. But as of 2018, it had only earned a few billion dollars total. During COVID, it actually did quite a bit better. But still, they've earned under 100 billion total compared to all of the incredible products they've been delivering to you for decades. Or maybe not you for decades, but all right. Okay, now. Just to repeat, uh, none of the world's most capitalist countries actually live up to the capitalist ideal, but it's still a useful benchmark. Uh, so when you could say, well, right, we know what it's like now, how much better could it get if we actually move the relatively capitalist countries over to the ideal? Right, I've only got time for the highlights, and it's gonna be these. All right, uh, first of all, even the most capitalist countries heavily restrict immigration. Right, Non-citizens need government permission to live and work there, and actually, this permission is almost impossible for most people on Earth to ever attain. Right, so what would happen if we deregulated immigration so anyone on Earth could take a job anywhere? Well, uh, there would be massive international migration. I do have another book that didn't get mentioned on that, but um, it is clear that there would be enormous migration around the world if people could legally do so. And what would, uh, what would drive it? People would move from countries where their labor is, has low productivity to countries where their labor has high productivity, which enriches humanity. Uh, a standard long-run estimate is this would do something like doubling the production of mankind. We can go through the math in the Q&A if you want. And all the while, greatly reducing global inequality <clears throat> and poverty. Why? Because people that are most likely to move are the ones that have the most to gain. Uh, another big deviation from capitalist principles that we see in nominally capitalist countries is that they all tightly regulate construction working on a book on this right now, especially in high wage areas. You guys are in one of the really good places where you can build cheap stuff, but most places, suspend most, but you know, say the Bay Area, California, New York, very hard to build. All right, so if these laws were repealed, there would be a very large increase in the supply of housing in the most prosperous parts of the country, uh, which again would soon be followed by a lot of movement inside of the United States because the main reason people are not moving to High wage areas is that housing is so expensive that you're actually poor when you go to a high wage area. All right, now standard estimates of even very modest housing deregulation say would raise US GDP by 10%. And again, markedly reduce poverty and inequality in the process. A uh, third deviation that I'd like to see eliminated. All right, so even the most capitalist countries engage in a lot of involuntary redistribution. Uh, the strange thing is that most of the redistribution doesn't even focus on the poor but on the old. Right? If these laws had never existed, a large majority of people would have just taken care of their own retirement, and of course taxes would be a lot lower, so saving would be a lot easier. I mean, what about the minority of people who can't take care of themselves? See, honestly, it would cost so little compared to the status quo that it is not unreasonable to leave it to private charity, but if that seems like wishful thinking, we can just have a tiny welfare state for that residual of poor children, severely handicapped, and so on. Now, last thing I'm gonna bring up. Even the most capitalist countries have a very large role for government education. They are heavily subsidizing it as the normal procedure all through the world. Uh, in the case of education, I argue the main effect of these subsidies is not to prepare people for good jobs, but just to spark totally fruitless credential inflation. What does that mean? It means that you need to get a degree in order to get the same job that your parents or grandparents could have gotten without the degree. Right now. Uh, if these laws were repealed, I'd say we would still be literally numerate, but you could become independent and self-supporting years earlier. I mean, what about poor kids? So my preferred answer is private charity, but if that's not good enough for you, a means-tested voucher program to fund education for just people that cannot afford it is a small departure. All right, oh. All right. now, what is so bad about the socialist idea? Well, system based on government authority and coercion, 
Uh, democracy is a good way to mitigate mass murder and slavery under socialist dictatorships, uh, but even under democratic socialism, uh, the individual is at the mercy of popular opinion, and popular opinion is not pretty. Uh, socialists do like to compare their ideal society to a family. It's a strange thing. In actual families, you don't have to support your siblings if you don't want to. You don't even have to support your parents who gave you life. So why should your obligation to complete strangers be any stronger? Uh, the idea that the rich are morally obliged to give away everything they don't need until poverty is vanquished has some superficial appeal. But objectively speaking, we all in this room clearly have more than we actually need, especially if you remember the market value of free time. So I really do not like hyperbole, but if a socialist government really enforced the obligation to give away all your surplus to the poor, you really would be a slave. Now, the looming doubt. Is socialism one of those ideals that sounds terrible, but is actually wonderful in real life? So again, I suggest we go to the actual most socialist countries we've seen and see how they worked out. Uh, so the most socialist countries in the world by most rankings today are North Korea and Venezuela. There's no decent socialist who upholds these health states as ideals, so I'm not gonna accuse Scott of saying that. Uh, and there's plenty of ways that you could go and try to bring North Korea and Venezuela more into the ideals of socialism, like stop murdering and jailing people that are against the ruling plutocrats. But still, as long as the North Korean and Venezuelan economic policy stay the same, what will democracy really do for you? I mean, uh, short of abandoning socialism. <clears throat> All right, now, uh, so people often do mock socialists for insisting that true socialism has never been tried. I'm not gonna say that because I don't think true capitalism has been tried either. Uh, but if we wanna forecast the effects of the true versus either system, it still makes sense to start with the closely, closely existing approximations and then analyze the probable effects of bringing policies in harmony with the ideals. Right, when we do that, say that capitalism is a wonderful ideal that is likely to work wonderfully in practice, socialism is a terrible ideal that is likely to work terribly in practice. Thank you. So first, thank you so much to TCU, to the Roach Foundation, to Sam and to Rob for inviting me and to everyone for being here. It's an honor to have this opportunity to debate this important topic with Brian. Um, that question, which is better capitalism or socialism, is a bit like this question, which food is better, sweet or salty? Um, this is not a simple either or question, since sweetness and saltiness come in degrees. That's not to say that the question is ill-formed or incomprehensible. We know that we're asking which foods are better, those on the sweet side of the spectrum or those on the salty side. And the right answer is those on the salty side. Um, <laughs> socialism and capitalism also come in degrees. If you like graphs, um, we could put it in two dimensions or axes. On the y-axis, I have the degree to which resources are distributed equally. And on the x-axis, the degree to which there is collective control or ownership of the means of production, the stuff that we need to produce goods. In the case of sweet versus salty, there's really no right answer, of course. It's just a matter of taste. But by contrast, our question is a moral one and not just a matter of preference or taste. How ought we to organize our political and economic system? Where should we be on this graph? I have a dot there for the United States, but I don't mean anything very precise by its location. I also put a dot in the upper left for what we can call classic socialism, which would have nearly complete collective control of the economy and egalitarian distribution. Based on data that we can talk about in the question period, the Northern European countries, the Nordic countries in particular, would be up and to the left of the United States, though not as far as classic socialism. I'll mention that the communist regimes of the Soviet bloc don't fit easily here. They did have reasonably egalitarian distribution of resources, but the one-party authoritarian nature of the regimes meant that they did not have truly collective control of the economy or ownership, because genuinely collective control requires democracy. My position is that we should move much further up and to the left, at least as far as the Scandinavian democracies, probably further. Though I would not give up markets altogether, I advocate a much more egalitarian distribution of resources than we have now, and much more collective control and ownership of the means of economic production. Why would I move in this direction? Here's my basic argument. Um, 
Premise one, socialism promotes <coughs> human well-being. That is capitalism. Premise two, socialism does not violate the moral rights of individuals. Premise three, given two styles of governance, if the first better promotes human well-being than the second and does not violate moral rights of individuals, then it should be chosen over the second. And it follows from these three premises that socialism should be chosen over capitalism. The third premise is explicitly moral. It talks about what we should do, and the claim is that we should have the form of government that maximizes well-being as long as it doesn't violate rights. It's the first two premises that are presumably the most contentious, and I'll say a little bit about each. I'll begin with the second premise. In the sense that I'm using the term, to say that a person has a right to do some action X is to say this, that it would be wrong for the government to prohibit X, even if prohibiting X would better promote human well-being in general. Rights are like trump cards over utility considerations, and in a sense that has nothing to do with Donald Trump. <laughs> Pure utilitarians would deny that we have any rights in this sense, but the issue raised by, but, but I'm inclined to think that we do. For example, the right to free speech and the right to freedom of religion. Now, any actual government might violate rights, but the question involved by quest premise two is whether it's in the nature of socialism to violate rights, and I don't think so. For starters, I see no reason at all to think that socialism means abridging political rights like free speech or freedom of religion. Nothing about having more egalitarian distribution or more democratic collective control of the economy implies that there should be any limitation on political rights. There are those who would claim that egalitarian distribution itself violates a different right, for it does involve taking money from one person, and sometimes without their explicit consent, and spending it for the benefit of other people. You might have heard the expression, taxation is theft. However, in this regard, there's nothing so special about taxation for the purpose of redistribution as opposed to taxation for the purpose of funding, say, police, courts, or national defense. If taxation is theft, then it's theft regardless of how the tax dollars are then spent. Unless you're willing to say that, own, that any taxation at all is a violation of rights, I don't see any justification for the claim that egalitarian distribution in particular is a violation of rights. And if your position is that you're against any taxation at all, then you're pretty much way off this chart. Um, you would basically be an anarchist, and since this debate is socialism versus capitalism, anarchism aside. Um, I should mention that yes, the Soviet bloc countries in China, which call themselves socialists, did typically violate rights like free speech, and the capitalist United States. We even more egregiously violated the rights of black people through, allowing, through laws allowing slavery and subsequent Jim Crow laws. In neither case, does it follow that it is part of the nature of that form of government that it violates rights? So if socialism doesn't violate rights, then the key issue is premise one, which form of government will better promote human well-being? There are two broad sorts of considerations that seem to point in opposite directions. On the one hand, money has diminishing marginal utility. An extra thousand dollars will mean a lot more to the well-being of a poor person struggling to feed her family than it would to a rich person or to a comfortably upper middle class person like me. So on the face of things, we can bring about more well-being overall by having a distribution of resources that is at least closer to being equal. On the other hand, if it is not a zero-sum game, it could be that we need inequality to motivate people and that allowing substantial inequality could lead to greater wealth and better overall well-being, even if it does make some people absurdly rich and others very poor. So we should look at some more data. One place to look is with data collected by the epidemiologist Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. They look at various measures of well-being and correlate them with degrees of inequality. Here is one chart that they produce with income equality on the x-axis and the UNICEF index of child well-being on the y-axis. The trend is clear. Countries with lower levels of inequality have children that are better off. It's important to note that this is the well-being of children we're talking about here. There can be no claim that children in countries like the United States are just getting what they deserve, unless you think that those poor children should have done a better job of choosing their parents. Wilkinson and Pickett also present this chart, 
which has their own overall index of health and social problems on the y-axis axis, and in, in at income inequality on the x-axis. The correlation is even stronger, greater inequality, more health and social problems. It's also worth noting on this graph that the countries with lower inequality, especially the Nordic countries, tend to have much more collective control and ownership of the economic means of production, at least as measured by gross measures like the degree of government ownership of property and the size of government per capita. So we would get a similar correlation with decreasing degrees of collective control and more health and social problems. Or we could simply look at the World Happiness Report. And notice that year after year, it's the Northern European countries that report the highest rates of happiness and satisfaction with their lives. So how far can we go in the upper left direction to increase happiness? That's hard to say with any <clears throat> certainty, but I see no reason to think that we can't go at least as far and probably further than the Scandinavian countries in the direction of lowering inequality and expanding democratic control over the economy. I'll close by mentioning one reason for thinking that the need for collective control is particularly urgent, the threat posed by climate change. As early as 2006, the one-time World Bank chief economist Nicholas Stern said, climate change presents a unique challenge for economics. It is the greatest example of market failure we have ever seen. Burning fossil fuels with abandon might be good for the account, bank accounts of individual actors. But what we see so clearly in the case of climate change is this. Transactions that are economically advantageous for those immediately involved can be terrible for other human beings, and especially for future generations of human beings. That's why it's a market failure. But back to the basic argument to finish, I think there's a good case to be made for all three premises. The well-being of humanity depends on us reducing inequality and exerting more democratic control over market forces. The well-being of humanity depends on us moving in a socialist direction. Thank you. So let's just start with the graph where we had the two axes. So we had the axes of collective control and we had the axis of equality. Now, if you've read the chapter in his book, it starts off by saying, I hate the phrase, beg the question, but I'm going to use it accurately here. Uh, key premise is, you know, does government actually reduce inequality? Well, there are some things government does that plausibly reduce inequality. But you might notice uh, the, the, the reforms that I was talking about for moving from the actual observed capitalist countries to the capitalist ideal. Uh, actually, all of those would seem to be, uh, be pushing very much in the direction of more equality. So for example, right now, the single best predictor of a person's income and well-being is just what country you're born in. If you're born in a rich country, then you do well. If you're born in a poor country, you do poorly. Why is it that this is so predictive? Because normally, it's almost impossible for a person from a poor country to move to a rich country. Under actual capitalism, the capitalist ideal, people on Earth would be free to go and solve their own problem by moving. And thereby, they would not only go and solve their own problem, but enrich the world as well. Because like I said, the reason why it works out so well is that people generally move from places where productivity is low to places where productivity is high. Uh, this is really the heart of all immigration. It comes down to when a farmer moves from Mexico to the US, he produces a lot more food because our system works a lot better. The same person accomplishes a lot more in a richer country. Um, same goes for, let's see, yes. Um, let's see, yes, the regulation of construction. So yes, we do have a lot of regulation of construction. This is a violation of capitalist principles. If the free market were allowed to work, we would build a lot more housing, especially in most desirable locations. It would be a lot cheaper, which not only would be a big gain to people that, who, who are poor, but they would be able to afford a better place but there's also the indirect gain that it would be easier for people to go and move from poor areas of the U.S. to rich areas of the U.S. because the extra housing costs would not be eating up most of all of the gain. I mentioned the case of, let's see, I, I mentioned also the case of the subsidization of education. But again, the hope is that this is just going to go and lead to a great modern workforce able to go and cope with the modern economy. I have a whole book where I just say this is just not true. Most of what you learn in school is actually completely useless in the real world. And the best way to think about your education is that it is a passport to the real training which happens on the job. 
What we've really done is just prolong the amount of time where you were dependent upon your parents. You pay a lot of money to schools in order to go and get that stamp on your forehead. And then finally, at the end, you can get a job. What if people could just start their life based upon well, actually doing an apprenticeship uh, as, things, uh, as things were in the past? Again, not only is this a much better thing to do economically because we cut out a lot of the waste, it is also a good way of reducing poverty and inequality so you don't need to have a college degree in order to be considered worthy to even try to learn to do a better job. Uh, skipping ahead to the global warming, here's another important and notable thing the government does to make this problem worse. There's a near ban on nuclear power. One thing I really like about Sweden is that for a while, guess what? They actually did switch nuclear power at a faster rate than any other country in history. They were able to get carbon emissions way down, but then guess what? Democracy came along and made a giant deal out of a very tiny risk from nuclear power, and Sweden has now shut down almost all their nuclear plants, and they are the path to actually finish with that. Here we have a viable solution, but the problem is that it works technologically, it works economically, but it doesn't work politically. All right, let's see. Um, now, in terms of Scandinavian democracies, um, here's one thing I'd like to say. Uh, have you been to any of these countries? Yeah, so I've been to three out of the four that you're mentioning anyway. Like, are they terrible? No. Are they great? No. They seem like completely mediocre countries to me, and if, <laughs> and if we had open borders just for Scandinavians, there is no doubt that a large share of them, they speak very good English, would be moving over here so they could have a better life than they do there. Uh, you might say it is better for perhaps the bottom quarter of their populations. Well, worse for the top three quarters, and they are people too. We really should be thinking about them. Um, all right, I'll say so, uh, it. At least it's one where I really think before you get excited about these countries, you should go and visit them. And I do strongly urge you to actually go to the grocery stores just to get an idea about what it's like really like there. And I think you will be quite disappointed when you see it. Now on the question of rights, uh, here there was a strange equivocation. I know he is the philosophy professor, I'm just an economist, although I do think about philosophy a lot. Uh, there is one version of rights where you say the right is absolute, it, does, it is a trump, it doesn't matter what the consequences are, you're allowed to do it. Uh, but this is a pretty crazy version of rights. This would be th saying things like, well if you, right to have a free, if you have a right to free speech, we would be wrong to go and stop you from shouting fire in a crowded theater. It would be wrong to go and silence one person for one minute in order to prevent an asteroid from hitting the Earth if somehow that was necessary. The more reasonable view of rights is that these are moral principles where the consequences of violating them would have to be very good in order to justify it. And that's how rights almost always work in practice. So you th say things like, all right, you have a right of free speech. Normally, we don't worry about what the exact consequences are, but if the consequences are bad enough, then it is actually okay to do it. Now, once you have this more reasonable view of rights, it, it seems very odd to say, well, it only applies to freedom of speech and freedom of religion. How about freedom to choose your occupation? Socialist countries have abridged that in the past. How about the freedom to not hand the government over your land? This is actually where most of the body count from actually existing socialism comes from, is when the government has said, all farmers hand over your land now or we'll kill you. And farmers, guess what, don't want to hand over their land. I say, don't they have a right to not hand their land over? It's their land, why should they have to do it? Right, and you would say, well, what if it would require, it would, it would, it would cause the extinction of the human race if they didn't hand over their land? Right, well, maybe they should, and their rights is not that important. But on the other hand, what if, as in the real world, it is not the case, there's some great disaster that you are preventing in that way? Uh, then it seems totally reasonable to say that people do have such rights. Uh, in terms of the promoting of human well-being, um, I will say that several of these measures seem very suspect to me, so I wouldn't trust anything from UNICEF. There is also something called the Human Development Index, which is deliberately engineered to make the Scandinavian countries the best countries in the world. So I would, it's really just a measure of how Scandinavian your country is. That happiness measure, I think, is a lot better. Here, I do know the data quite well. And the main thing to know is that almost all rich countries are very closely bunched up at the top. And so, that, so when you go and talk about they're the top five, you really have to take out your Cisco microscope to see the differences between the Scandinavian countries and a country like the United States. It is the difference between being at like 8.2 and 8.8 .8 on a 10 point scale, so I wouldn't really put a great deal of stock in that. Uh, on this question of choosing your parents, uh, this is actually something that I do talk about 
quite a bit thinking about immigration. You know, when someone says, well, you're born in Mexico, so too bad for you. Right? Uh, you're not allowed to come to the United States. This is, of course, what every rich country says, and in fact, it is what Scandinavian countries say as well. Right? When your idea is that if you are in a country, you're entitled to be supported by taxpayers in the country, you can kind of understand why they're reluctant to let people in. Right? Um, but this then winds up being an excuse for preventing someone from doing something that seems totally unobjectionable, which is just coming to a rich country and getting a job and improving their life in that way. Um, you see, like, the main thing that I'm always puzzled about when I do debate socialists is that they seem to have such a accepting view of democracy as it is. I almost never hear of any list of bad government policies that need to be changed unless the government policy is not having enough government. But there really are a lot of government policies where if you really study the actual effects, I would think that socialists would be against them. I think that socialists would be very against immigration restrictions. I do know some that when press will say, oh yeah, we should do that too. It's like, why is that not your number one thing that you care about? Why are you so worried about billionaires instead of someone from Haiti is not able to come and shine shoes on Miami as a matter of law? Same thing with housing regulation. Uh, now here I will say that a lot of people who are in favor of housing deregulation are actually at least somewhat left wing. But even they feel very frustrated, generally, that it's so hard to get anyone else on the left to care about a case where government is impoverishing us, increasing poverty, and increasing inequality, and where the solution is pretty obviously just to go and change the laws. You can build tall buildings, you can build apartment buildings, you can build houses close together, and thereby solve the problem. Um, let's see. Um, so on the point of dimension margin utility, I think that's totally true, but if you took it seriously, you would just not be worried about the very small differences in relative terms between the income of people, rich people and poor people in the first world. You would be trying to figure out a way to get high economic growth in the third world, as well as figuring out a way to get a lot more people from the third world into the first world, which is a, an essential feature of an actual capitalist policy. So we'll stop there. I basically agree. I don't have any problem with making our borders much more open. Um, I will have some caveats, not about making borders more open, but about the sort of thought behind it and this being the be all and the end all and the solution to everything. Um, but hopefully I'll get to that in a little bit. But just that you basically agree on that point. Um, so there's human well being and there's rights. Um, I'll say first a little bit about the rights. Um, is, I, I was being quick, it was only a 10 minute talk. Yes, I agree that rights are not an absolute trump card over utility in the sense of, you know, if you're playing a game of spades, if anybody knows that game, you know, and you have, and hearts are led and that you get the queen of hearts and the ace of hearts, and then even a two of spades wins the trick if you, if you can play spades. No, I don't mean trumps in that broad a sense such that it just overrides any utilitarian consideration. But the key point is that something's going to be a right if it does override utility considerations. It's like just saying that we'll be better off if we restrict political speech of X, Y, and Z sort. If there's a right to free speech, the idea is no, we shouldn't do it anyway. Um, even if we would be somewhat better off. Yes, in absolutely extreme circumstances, and when the value of the speech is very little, you might make some exceptions there. Um, but yes, so I don't think, now, with that background, um, the rights that Ma Brian mentions, the putative rights that Brian mentions, freedom to choose your own occupation, um, I mean, we have limited freedom in that respect anyway. Um, you know, I would have loved to have been a professional baseball player, but I couldn't just choose to do so, um, lacking the talent um, that was required for that, lacking the background to some extent, although. Um, but more broadly, and so with, so it's not like you all have the freedom to choose any occupation you want anyway. You have to go where the jobs are, that sort of thing. Um, to the extent 
that more collective ownership and control of the economy um, would mean that you would have less choice there than you already do now. I'm not sure to what extent that would necessarily be true. It might be true. We might have some regulation of certain industries such that there are fewer jobs available there. Um, you know, fewer jobs involving selling fossil fuels or something like that, if that's your, your heart's desire. Does that mean that you're, you have a right to choose the job to sell fossil fuels, to do something like that, even if it diminishes overall human welfare? That's not obvious to me. It's just not at all obvious to me that that would be a right in the sense that I'm talking about. If you think it would lead to overall well-being being improved, that's a different issue. Um, and, and, and so I don't think Brian was disputing the, the town. I mean, he talked about an extreme example of handing over all your land and the collective forced collectivization, um, the sort of thing that I'm talking about of more redistributive um, taxation in order for more redistributive resources. I don't think he's saying that that's a violation of rights, but you know, I certainly don't think that it is. Um, on the human well-being, um, Brian thinks that Scandinavia is mediocre. I kind of like it, I said, <laughs> but I just did. Um, but, but, and he doesn't trust the data. Okay, there are a lot of detailed questions one could go into there, and we could look at the details of the UNICEF data and the degrees of inequality and a lot of these things. Um, and we could, you know, and you could note that yes, the United States is lower on the happiness index. He says, yeah, but it's not that much lower. It's like, well, but notice that he's kind of, he's explaining away the data now here. It's not that, you know, he came in saying, look how great capitalism is, look how much prosperity produces. Now we have countries that are admittedly less capitalist and they're happier. He says, well, yeah, but they're not that much happier. Um, and we can quibble about various things about that data. That's true, those are, tech, those are difficult questions, but, you know, it seems like on the face of it, there's a lot of data out there that says we can go, uh, we can be much happier here. Um, and let's see, so then, and then that goes back to one of the reasons that Brian, along with a lot of other defenders of capitalism, really like capitalism is this idea that you are consenting, you get to consent to whatever you're doing. You have individual business transactions. I agree to do this, you agree to do that. We, I sell you my services and you pay me money for them. And if we're both consenting and we're both doing it voluntarily, then presumably we're both better off at the end of it, if it was genuine, genuinely voluntary. He mentions the issues that sometimes it's not so voluntary, and that's true, definitely. Um, there are times when you know, it's, and, and he dismisses it to some extent, but if you have only one choice of employer, I mean, because basically, unless you inherited a lot of money, um, the one thing you have to sell in the economy that's significant is your labor. And if you're in circumstances where there's only one employer or the employers are conspiring to make wages lower, then how much choice do you have? Yes, you could move. You could even move from Mexico to the United States, or you can move from Sweden to the United States or from the United States to Sweden. There's a lot of cost to that, and I don't just mean the, cost, the, the actual dollars cost of moving. Uprooting, pulling yourself away from your family, your friends. This is why I say, you know, the, the quick talk of, I mean, I'm a, I agree with Brian on immigration and open immigration, but the idea that this is just, oh, all you have to do is get up and move. If there's not a job here, go to another country. Leave all your friends, leave your family. Go to a place where you don't speak the language. It's a lot harder than it, than, it's, uh, than Brian makes it sound. Um, but more, also, more generally, the consent ideal of that if you have two people, they shake hands on a deal, they must both be better off. Presumably so, to the extent that it was voluntary. Like I said, there are some limitations on how much it was voluntary. But even if they're better off, that doesn't mean everybody else is better off. It's not as if the maximum, each person doing that means that everybody is better off in general. Because sometimes two people can agree to do something that's better for them, but hurts other people. Somebody builds a factory and they sell some object, batteries or whatever, but they do it in a way where there's effluent from the factory that pollutes the local river and harms people downstream. Or puts fossil fuels into the air and harms future generations. The people that bought the product from the factory and the factory owner, they made a 
nice voluntary deal and they're perfectly happy with it in the sense that they feel they're better off than they were before that deal. The others around them might disagree. These are what economists call negative externalities. I kind of like the Milton Friedman term neighborhood effects for that. And a lot of our choices have these neighborhood effects. And that's where it, it sounds so appealing to think, yeah, if we're just all doing what we're consenting to do in business, then we will not have, then we will all be happier. Um, but that is by far, by no means guaranteed. What is better for each person in a tra business transaction is not necessarily better for all. Climate change and global warming is one of the key things here in that regard. Brian brings up that government has made some governments, different governments have made some bad decisions in this respect, and that's certainly true. I, I don't know what to say about nuclear power. I haven't looked into the issues of what the, you know, it's tricky because yes, you might say it's a small risk of a meltdown, but there's this waste that lasts for hundreds of thousands of years that's radioactive. I, I don't know. It might be that nuclear power was our solution to climate change, and we blew it by kind of short-circuiting nuclear power and we'll have to go back to it. That might be right, I don't know. And it might also have been a government failure. Um, so government occasionally makes some bad decisions. So they make some bad decisions a lot of the time. The question is, is the market going to be better? Um, where the market works by short-term profit, you know, what is good for the pocketbooks of the companies making the, and selling the energy What's good for you and me, because we get cheap gasoline and cheap ways to, fuel, to heat our homes, but is that going to be better overall? Should we just trust that the market will deal with climate change in the way that will make it best for future generations? That seems far less plausible to me. No, I don't think that it's automatically guaranteed that if we leave it to government and give government more regulatory power over climate change decisions, that we will automatically have things be better off because governments can make stupid decisions too. But I think that at least there's hope in that, in, in that regard because government is, if in its best form, us. It is democracy. It is us acting in the interest of the people and hopefully, especially when we're voting, if not when we're just you know, buying gasoline <coughs> for our cars, we are sort of thinking a little bit more about our children and our grandchildren and future generations of other people not related to us necessarily. And so at least I have some more hope for government and governance dealing with the problem of climate change than I do for markets doing it alone by themselves. Um, whether that will work out in the end, I can't say for sure. Um, but I will. These are indeed very complex issues, and we've all, I've only got five minutes to settle them, so here's what I'm going to appeal to. Everyone here has first-hand experience with markets, everyone here has first-hand experiences with democracy, and you've got especially first-hand experiences with the public sector. All right, well, what has it been like? I'm just going to tell you how it is for me. When I deal with Amazon, I get fantastic products, low prices, super convenient. Anytime I have a problem, they fix it for me. You click on that box and they say, how can we make it right? I say, how about you give me back all my money and I drop it off at Whole Foods. Great, and it happens. You can go to Costco and again, get enormous abundance. You can just walk around the most capitalist countries and wonder at how incredibly good the standard of living is. You can just look at the people and see how healthy people look. You can see how well-dressed they are, how well-fed they are, maybe too well-fed, right? On the other hand, I will just say all my experience with the public sector, except as a government employee, has been terrible. That's the one exception. Government works great for government employees like me, as George Mason University, contrary to what many people think, it's a public university. So what is it? It's one where we get a pile of taxpayer money to do next to nothing. Right? You can actually wander around the halls of George Mason, and, I, and if anyone wants to take this idea and do it on YouTube, you didn't get the idea from me, just wander around and film almost any department on campus. In the middle of the day, on a Wednesday, and you'll see, nobody seems to be there. They're all doing research at home, of course. That must be what's actually going on. Yeah, I don't think so. 
of government is highly parasitic. It's a great system for public employees. In terms of customer service or actually delivering decent goods, government sucks. And that includes democracy, of course. And again, just think about what is your actually, actual experience with democracy been? Let's see, well, the 2020 election. You got two choices, you got Trump or Biden. You feel really excited about that? It's like, goody, I've got these two wonderful possibilities. Could be Trump, he's cool, or it could be Biden. He's old but scrappy. Like, which one of them should be the supreme commander of the free world? Well, the choice is in your hands, all right? I'll just say, like, honestly, if you just strip away this fantasy about it's us people deciding things together and realize, look, this is what the system actually does. It puts power into the hands of demagogues. And if you really listen to what they're saying, right, well, even politicians that I agree with, if I just go and imagine scoring the sentences for truth, it's what they're saying is not true. It is highly emotional nonsense in order to go and get votes. And that's what's really going on in democracy. When you shop, at least you are the one paying the consequence of making a bad decision. You can go into a grocery store and fill it full of junk and pay max top dollar for it, but guess what, almost no one does. On the other hand, what do we see happening in democracies? Not just an occasional tiny error, like, like getting rid of nuclear power in Sweden when it was solving all the problems people are complaining about on the basis of some scary stories and accidents that killed no one or next to no one. Right? Um, you know, or we, have, we see governments saying you aren't allowed to build housing. Or again, preventing immigration so that people can't just solve their own problems. Now, it is true that it is a burden for people to move, but guess what? It's a burden that people around the world would love to have because the difference between the lives they're living and the lives that they can have in another country or often in a different state really is tremendous. Uh, in the case of leaving behind family and friends, most of that really does come from the existing laws where maybe one person in a family can get a work permit. And then you face this tragic choice, either I go and take it and send money home to my starving kids, or we keep our family together. Right under what I'm talking about, you can just take your family with you. Um, so also I would mention that it is not nearly as bad to go and leave, and leave behind the country you're born in if the country you're born in is actually a refugee camp, or is in, you know, is in a refugee, or your refugee camp is in that country. Uh, it is much, more, much easier to understand why people don't want to leave a place that is working pretty well than a place where people are having trouble meeting their most basic needs. Let's see, how much time have we got? A minute. A minute, okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm so sorry. Let me just hammer home again this point that there seems to be so little curiosity in Scott about the, the bad things that, that governments do, including bad things that democracies do. There's a lot of hope. I'm really puzzled by where this hopes come from, hope comes from. I have to think that half the time he hates the government of the United States. So what does it say to say, well, this is, I've got a great system, it works half the time. It's like if Amazon gave you what you wanted half the time, you would stop shopping there. When government gives you what you want half the time, it's like, oh, well, great. Right? Not actually so good. Uh, I guess I'll just end with one last point. Uh, this freedom to choose your occupation being limited because you won't, don't have the talent to be a baseball player. Scott's a philosopher. He knows that that is a, a, an equivocation. You would say the same thing, well, for, you don't really have free speech because you're not smart enough to make a good argument. All right, yes, there's one sense in which if you lack certain abilities, then you're not free to do it, but that's not the one that anyone in political philosophy is talking about. There you're talking about whether if you have the capability, are you allowed to go and do it? And it is a freedom that has been restricted by actual historical socialist governments, not much in Scandinavia, but he said he wants to go beyond Scandinavia, so I think we should be worried. You can have five and a half minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Winston Churchill quote, um, I think we all push out this and I don't have it written down, you know, democracy is the worst form of government except all the others that have been tried. Now, maybe Brian is suggesting that we shouldn't try to have any government at all, or just saying we should have less of it, less over economic decisions in particular. Um, and it's a, there's an interesting irony here, it seems to me, anyway, that, um, you know, Brian's the social scientist, I'm the philosopher. Um, 
And kind of the, the gist of the, the last statement was, well, how's it been, how's it been for you? Um, what's your first-hand experience? What, you know, go with your gut here. What do you think of you know, Amazon? What do you think of living in the United States? What do you think of government? And counting on you to have the same sort of gut reactions that he does from your own personal experience. And your own personal experience counts. That is definitely something that matters here. Um, but it leaves out a number of other things. Um, for starters, other people. Um, you know, I'm not only concerned about my experience shopping at Amazon, um, but about, you know, poorer people who can't afford to shop at Amazon. Um, others less fortunate, and also future generations of people. That's where the climate change in particular comes in. But the other thing, that besides just looking beyond myself and my own gut reactions and my own personal experience, the, the interesting irony is that, you know, I'm looking at data um, about some of these things. Uh, now Brian has quibbles, well, quibbles, putting this lightly. Um, you know, he has, he has objections to these, these bits of data, but they are, they're, they're, it's a start, it's something more, you know, it's, it's also data, I should say, your experience and saying, based on your experience of Amazon, how's capitalism? That's data too. It's just one data point, you. Um, whereas these sorts of charts were a whole lot of data about different sorts of government. When you reduce inequality, health and social problems go down, child welfare goes up, and happiness increases, as in the World Happiness Report <coughs> was saying. Um, and so that it's kind of interesting, you know, and, and yes, government can fail, can be bad in various cases, but um, I've got some other data here, just as government spending as percentage of GDP, the Scandinavian countries um, have much more, much bigger government, much more government, and yet they're happier. He says, well, they're not that much happier. Didn't deny that they were happier. Um, so, I mean, this, this screed against government, sure, government has its problems, but what is the alternative is another question, but also we have data indicating that countries with more regulation, more government, more collective ownership, because the Scandinavian countries also own more than of the, the collective, of the means of production in the United States, that in those countries there are fewer health and social problems and people are happier. That seems relevant to me. Um, <clears throat> and then, what's the alternative? Um, yes, uh, Trump versus Biden is not the happiest choice that I would like to have. So what do I do, just leave it to Elon Musk? Just to businesses? Just to people making, making lots of money? Um, I'm not sure that that sounds to me much better. So I'm not saying that socialism is some sort of you know, wonderful ideal that's just obviously going to just have you know, flowers raining about us and, and rainbows all over the place. But I am saying that the data indicate that it works better and that inequality in particular is toxic to human well-being. And if we don't do something to, if we do something to mitigate that, we will be happier. Wilkinson and Pickett point out that it's actually, it's not just the poorer people that are happier in Sweden and Norway, that inequality makes people less happy across the income spectrum. So we'll be happier if we do this. That's what I think the data indicates. Um, I, Grant, Brian, that there are problems implementing anything with this, and that government doesn't always work perfectly by any means. But, like I said, democracy is our best hope. Thank you. Great, well we have time now for some questions for our speakers. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. We stay here or we go someplace? Um, probably, I mean, if, if you don't mind standing where you were standing, both of you could just sort of be up in the front. We do, we do opposite sides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of us should be on the left and the right. <laughs> it's hard to say. It's it's right. Right. Yeah. 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 Questions for our speakers? Yes, sir. In the hat. Oh, sorry, can you speak up a little? Yeah, hi. 
Oh, I mean, actually, sorry, I brought a preamble. Do try to keep your questions sh on the shorter side so we can get more people involved. Uh, mentioned that you know, true or like true socialism and true capitalism both have not been tried, so we should look at the countries that have come closest to mm -hmm. the ideals. Uh, how do you, in that uh, socialist countries have tended to fail while capitalist countries mm -hmm. have tended to survive? Uh, would you uh, say that some of that has to do? with uh, capitalist countries like the United States intervening in countries when they try to uh, socialize more parts of their economy like Iran uh, in the 50s or um, maybe Central American countries, uh, other examples like that. So the fact that socialism didn't work, was that due to U.S. intervention? No, it's true the U.S. did to make some effort to go and prevent revolutionary socialists from taking over countries. Very little effort made to stop in the Soviet Union, and then at the end of World War II, there were a whole bunch of other countries that fell into the Soviet bloc. Um, let's see, probably not. I know a bit about Iran, but um, I guess my story would be that you know, the U.S. went and prevented a few countries from rolling into socialism, but screwed it up in a bunch of other ways. And um, you know, as to what, like, the whole history of Iran, I could go on for an hour, but I think I could do an hour. But it's hard. Um, that, that's a frequently raised hypothesis. Um, one interesting thing about it is, you know, because at, in, in one of the World Happiness Reports a couple of years ago, um, they had a chapter specifically saying, okay, what's up with the Nordic countries? Why are they always at the top of our happiness ranking? And they, they looked into that hypothesis that it was the homogeneity, and they said, first of all, it's not that homogeneous. Um, they have more immigrants than we do. Um, and by percentage in Sweden anyway. I, I can go back and look up the, the details there. So they're not as, as homogenous as, as, as one might be inclined to, to guess, to think that. It's also, I'll just mention, a really depressing thought. Maybe there's something to it, but it's a really depressing thought that, well, we can all kind of be in it together. We can, we can do things for each other and sort of be happy to redistribute our wealth because these are our people because, well, they look like us, but as long as they're racially different, then it won't work. That's just like an assumption that people are just fundamentally racist in a way that, I'm not saying that you are, of course, but that there's some, the assumption that it won't work if the country is not racially and ethnically homogenous. I'll just put it this way. If that's true, that's really different. That's what it's so I actually do know something about that. I, so a lot of the research on this very question is done by Scandinavian social scientists, and that is the general view that when you have less, you have less homogeneity, this undermines support for the welfare state, and then this does lead Scandinavian social scientists to say, oh, and no, on the one hand, we love our welfare state. On the other hand, we also love immigration, but what are we to do? And the normal reaction is, I guess we've got to go and cut down on the immigration. And this is where, for me, I'm saying, look, I think this is great. Let's go and get rid of the welfare state and open the borders at the same time. And because this is all based upon this nonsensical idea that countries are families anyway. Like, they are not. And even in families, people don't think that you have some obligation to go and support your siblings or your parents. So where is this idea that you owe total strangers in your country to go and take care of them? It is just a very strange and really totalitarian idea. Like, imagine if you just had to take care of your siblings no matter what. How would you feel about that? It's like, well, my siblings are good. All right, what if they weren't? Should you still have to go and take care of them forever, no matter how they act, no matter what they do? It's like, well, they're adults. Maybe they should take care of themselves. Just a quick follow-up for Brian. I mean, wouldn't that same lack of cosmopolitan concern mm -hmm. cut against your argument, too? Because why do I want to open my borders? Ah, great question. Of course, I'm not saying open it up so you can go and take care of people. I'm saying open it up so they can trade with you. 
So it's a very different story. You're talking about yes. lots of other people yeah. coming to yeah, the great. Country. Yeah, great. More, more than merrier. Why would people want that yeah. if they are limited in, in their sphere of concern? Right. So again, like the, there is one view of immigration where we let people in because even though people are a burden, we do it to be nice. That's one view. There's another view where it is actually highly prudent to let them in because they will work and they will contribute, and you will be their and you will be their customer. Right now, I will also add on. Uh, by the way, it sure seems like there is a basic human right for a person to go and move and take a job from a willing employer. But I'd also add it is just a lot less burdensome if you're expecting that when someone shows up, they're supposed to take care of themselves, uh, which does have a lot to do with different attitudes towards immigration. When, uh, when you just think of immigrants as charity cases, obviously this is where people are nervous about letting them in. And I will point out the countries in the world that are most open to immigration are not democracies, they're the Gulf monarchies. Right? And they'll say, wow, let's at least give some credit where credit is due. Here they do let them in. They also, by the way, have fantastic welfare states, as you probably know, in the Gulf monarchies, although they don't allow the immigrants to go and partake, which is a big part of the reason why they don't mind having the immigrants come. So much. They still don't like them, actually. <laughs> That's right. Other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Aaliyah, and I'm the, um, I have a question for you, um, Dr. Kaplan. I'm very, very tired of the regulation of immigration under mm -hmm. um, a capitalist ideal. And I was wondering, how would a capitalist framework uh, protect against the spurious names of, you know, um, poor pay for migrant mm -hmm. farmers or poor working conditions that we currently see under capitalism? And are, if this <coughs> I'll give my answer to the second question first, which is that if you've got a really great welfare state, then you've got to be worried about people moving their country because maybe it'll just go on welfare for their whole lives. You might say, well, you know, if they're Swedes and they, and they feel comfortable with you know, trying to succeed in the system, maybe they won't just take the easy way out. But you show up in a country and you don't know the language and you're not skilled and there's a big welfare package, yeah, you can see why you might just go on that for the rest of your life and why people would then be worried about you coming. In terms of the exploitation of workers, I do a whole class in labor economics, and the main thing I'll say is there's a reason why people are moving to your exploitative conditions, which is that it's a big improvement. Now, why is it such a big improvement? It's like, well, what we here call exploitative conditions is actually fantastic, according to most people around the world. Like, how can that be? Well, the answer is that when your productivity is really low, competition for your services doesn't yield a very high wage. When your productivity is higher, it gives you a higher wage. No one worries about Tom Cruise being exploited because we know he <coughs> has incredible talents to offer. The lower your talent is, the worse it's going to be. To call it exploitation, though, I would say is just, it's almost begging the question. Uh, <laughs> uh, namely, just to say, well, like, how do you know that a person's being exploited? Suppose someone is just not at all good at the job, and then they get a low, they get a low, pay, they get low pay. Were they exploited? So here's something that's probably relevant for students. Uh, have you ever considered taking an unpaid internship? Is that exploitation? It's like, well, you might say that, but on the other hand, you should consider, I don't know how to do anything. So when I show up, I arrive really being a burden, and then they pay me in actual training. It's like, hmm, well, why can't I get a better deal? Perhaps, again, because you don't know anything. So, well, I honestly, I'd say normally when people think of an exploitation really comes down to you don't have a lot of skills. Uh, it's something that is unfortunate, although it's also worth pointing out that the normal way that labor markets work is people start at the bottom, they don't know anything, and then guess what? Things improve because when you work, you acquire more skills, and you do then wind up working your way up. Mm -hmm. That is the normal way of it. You just mentioned that um, obviously a lot of socialists do argue for socialism on the basis of saying that capitalism is inherently exploitative of mm -hmm. the worker, because that's where profit comes. Even Tom Cruise? Um, but my, my saying, I notice I didn't make that. I'm saying it's better for human welfare overall. Um, <coughs> it rights. Um, I, I do think there are socialists who argue that capitalism violates rights, essentially, by saying that the very idea of the profit motive and profit being gained by taking the surplus value from workers is a violation of their rights. I'm not entirely convinced by that argument. I'm convinced by other arguments for moving in the socialist direction. Yes. Um, 
So Dr. Sihan Dr. Kaplan mentioned his vision for kind of education under capitalism. What do you think uh, a socialist view of the education system would be or how would that system benefit from uh, socialism? Um, yeah, and I was, I was actually just on the plane here. I was uh, reading Susan Brett's book on, on education and it is, it is kind of has a lot of depressing statistics about how in some respects it doesn't um, uh, suit people for the job market, that sort of thing. Um, and he takes, he talks about this. I, I don't think that the only point of your education is creating talents for the job market. I think there are other aspects to it. I, you know, I would quibble with some of his conclusions and there I recognize that we're not doing everything right. Um, his ultimate position is calls for a separation of school and state. In other words, none. Not, I mean, although he did not said in the talk today that, okay, well, maybe he would give vouchers so that people could, poor people could go to some small private schools. Um, the socialist vision certainly is, you know, let's fix education, let's make it better, let's make it more humane, and certainly make it more equal in, in terms of access. One of the problems that we have now is that, you know, that places to some extent like this, but also even more so in places that are like I teach, where like 20 percent of students to go voting are from the top 1% of the income bracket. Um, and that's not necessarily, you know, and, and so, so trying to help everyone and everyone get um, uh, the education that they need and the education that will help fulfill their lives would certainly be part of like, the socialist ideal. And so we, yes, I would keep funding education more, not less. Great. The, the main thing I would say is, you know, so you could either read my book, so there I do have 450 pages of social science, or you just think about your own experience. To what extent is what you've ever been taught at school relevant in real life? And it's like, oh, well, there's, there's some reading, there's some writing, there's some math. All right, and how about the other 70 or 80% of the time that you've been at school? What about that stuff? It's like, hmm. Yeah, and I say this is so typical of what government does. They go and they hear some high, uh, some flowery poetic rhetoric. Isn't it wonderful for everyone to get education? They throw a pile of money at it with, no, with very little accountability, no effort to see are people actually learning useful skills. And then when you go and try to find out, well, like, is this even working? They get mad at you. Right? So it's like, 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 you're, equi like we, we, you are questioning public education. Like, yeah, I'm questioning public education. I went through public education. I saw it was mediocre at best. You're spending a pile of money. It's taxpayer money. You might think that you have a responsibility to show that you're getting high value for it. And yet, the system goes on because it sounds good even though it isn't a very good use of money. Other questions? Yes. Hi. So following up on an earlier question of migration and working conditions, it seems that um, Again, that you said exploitative conditions are sort of begging the question, but just to use that term to establish what we talked about, lower mm -hmm. lower consideration for that type of labor. It seems that that would depreciate working conditions for citizens as well. So my question is, does not the devaluing of labor, the one major thing that we all have to offer, and the lack of regulation of this labor contribute to a decrease in human well-being? Yeah, fantastic question. All right, let me tell you the most important principle of economics. It's really easy. The secret of mass consumption is mass production. The secret of mass consumption is mass production. Every kind of progress you can think of has losers. Vaccines were bad for morticians, which means you cannot just sit around saying, is there anybody who loses out here? You need to focus on what actually happens to total production. The whole idea of immigration is precisely removing people from places where labor produces little to places where it produces much. The result is a very large increase in, increase in the production of humanity. Now, is it possible that nations will lose out? It's possible. So I'm pretty sure that I'm losing out because there's so many foreign economics professors that are competing with me. The key question for an individual is, are these immigrants selling what I sell or selling what I buy? If they're selling what you sell, then indeed there is a negative effect on you, just like the negative effect on back the vaccines on morticians. But if they're selling what you buy, then it is making your life better. So the net effect of this is actually very, a very large and positive. Uh, now you say, might there still be losers? Well, here there is a great, a great lesson of economic history, which is that whenever there's been a large increase in production, the effects have always been broadly beneficial. I was just asking another economics professor last night, can you think of any exceptions? 
No, the, the effect of improved, I go, improved productivity in agriculture, it was not just good for farmers, it was good for humanity. The effect of industrial revolution, not just good for factory owners, good for humanity. The effect of the internet, not just good for programmers, good for humanity. So I say always keep your eye on the ball of production. When people think about immigration, they tend to go and try to find something bad about it. And the honest answer is, yeah, there's something about it, bad, bad about it, because there's something bad about every kind of progress that has ever existed. But don't let that in any way sway you from support for progress, because if we allowed these small complaints to go and sway our thinking, we really would not have seen any of the incredible progress that we've enjoyed for the last 200 years. Like I said, I maintain that the really great capitalist reforms would instantly be, make it more equitable. So I think that it's highly inequitable that just because you're born in Mexico or Haiti, you can't come and get a job here. So under ideal capitalism, we would have an actual free labor market, and people could then come and take those jobs. Uh, in terms of the people who are already here, like, a very large problem of poor people in America is not being able to afford a home. Uh, one nice result of social science being mentioned is that you really can't attribute the entire rise in inequality in the U.S. just to rising housing prices over the last 60 or 70 years. So you deregulate housing, you make housing a lot cheaper, and then suddenly people that were previously struggling to be able to afford a home can go and enjoy a nice place. Uh, so I mean, nuclear power, cheap energy. Um, you know, I was mentioning education. Wouldn't it be great if people didn't need a college degree in order to get a good job? That used to be the way the U.S. economy worked. So in 1945, only about 25% of American adults would have even finished high school, and yet guess what? That meant that you could be a manager without even a high school degree, much less a college degree. I mean, it's like, how is it possible? I mean, high school dropouts today couldn't manage factories. Yeah, well, there's a big difference between high school dropouts today and high school dropouts in 1945. When you make it easier and easier to go and get education, the people that don't do it are more and more likely to be low productivity. So. But just to go and create a world of less credential inflation where you can go and get a good job without needing to go and get a college degree. So again, when I think about like we can go and try to make voting accessible to the world, it's like that sounds like a total pipe dream. Like if everyone could go to Bowdoin, then Bowdoin wouldn't be Bowdoin anymore. Right? But on the other hand, the idea of just going back to a world where the way that we decide who gets a good job is by getting a job and then promoting people based upon performance, that's what we would have a lot more of people listening to me. Sometimes our motivations are better than, than 
than you might think. Right, Kevin, if I can speak to that. Uh, one point against Scandinavia that I didn't mention, or, and I can also make this against the entire European Union, in terms of innovation, they do almost nothing. The United States crushes the entire European Union, and they've got more people than we do. Uh, you know, there's almost, there are almost no major new companies that have come out of the European Union in the last 15 years. Really, a lot of what's going on is they are free riding off of American R&D. We come up with the ideas, and then they go and adopt them. So without us, looks like they're doing very poorly. Now, you might say it's just a total coincidence. <laughs> it's possible. But it sure seems that there's a reason why Elon moved from South Africa to the United States, which is that this is a place where people like him can become fabulously rich by coming up with great new ideas, which can then be enjoyed by all humanity. Uh, I am jealous of uh, how things work at Bowdoin, mm -hmm. uh, because I know tons of people who are, super, who are in academia who are very lazy and basically do next to nothing. And they're terrible teachers, and they barely do any research. Uh, it is a telling indictment of the system that there is this low correlation between performance and pay. Like, why is that? What's going on there? A lot of it is just that it's a nonprofit, and nonprofits do not really make much effort in order to do this. Uh, but I would also say there's a huge difference in academia and most normal jobs, which is academic, academics do stuff that is fun, intrinsically, stuff where people are fascinated by. On the other end, there's a lot of jobs that are just not like that. Right, being a garbage man is not something where people are just going to wake up every morning and say it's so much fun to be a garbage man. And there's a lot of other jobs like that. So, you know, like, like I, I don't want to say that most jobs are miserable because that's not true either. What I think is true is that for most people, the thing that they like about their job is getting to be around other people, be part of, be part of a team. Uh, there's money, money is nice too. But there really is this fairly short list of occupations where you just count on professional pride to get, <coughs> get people to do as much as you're talking about. Uh, and then for most of them, if you, do, if you don't go and give better incentives, you really just don't get that much out of people. Mm -hmm. On top of it, there's also a mentality of it's just not fair that I go and do a lot more and get no more money. So it doesn't even have to be literal, literal, literally motivated by greed. It can also be just being discouraged by the sheer unfairness of people that work hard getting treated the same way as people who don't. I think we, we should wrap it up so that we have our time for oh, We have time for one more? Yeah. Okay, sure. Yes, sir. All right, so I have a question for both of you. Um, in your part of your argument, you talk about taxation. And I read the slogans of no taxation without representation, <laughs> and taxation is, is death. And I was wondering if there's any point of, of balance or uh, consensus between capitalists and socialists when it comes to administering taxation, uh, whether in this case scenario, scenario funding for military for Israel or subsidizing private or public education. Right, so taxation without, no taxation without representation and taxation of staff are totally different slogans. Right, so one is basically saying you can have democracy for taxation to be legitimate, and the other one is saying taxation is illegitimate. Um, my view is that taxation is theft unless it's actually really crucial to make an exception to keep uh, to prevent some sort of horrible disaster. Um, so my, my general view is it's not actually necessary to prevent horrible disasters, but so we don't have enough time to go over that. Uh, but anyway, I'd say you know, the more capitalist your view, the more anti-taxation you gotta be. <coughs> okay. um, and on this part, I feel <coughs> agreements on how much to tax and that sort of thing, but on the taxation, it, you know, taxation is theft. I mean, that's just a violation of rights. I mean, yeah, then it would have to be, yeah, it, so it would have to be for only enough for the tiniest yeah. amount of government to prevent utter disaster. And mm -hmm. maybe that's what Brian is happy with. You might want to think about whether that's what you're happy with, too, uh, uh, as whether, you know, um, if, if it's just, you know, rather than promoting human welfare in general, because it's, you know, taxation is not, if it's, if it's theft, it's theft, regardless of what it's for, um, whether it's for egalitarian and I'll mention that there's this economic data, as far as how much taxation, I thought maybe that was kind of where the drift of the question is, that um, there, there are economic papers about the optimal rate of taxation, where optimal is just a technical term meaning, how high can you push the tax rates and still get more tax revenue? Because obviously, if you, rate, if you raise the tax rates to 100%, and every single dime you make goes, is taxed, then, then of course you've lost any incentive to work, doesn't matter, you, you so there's got to be a limit somewhere. Right now, the top marginal tax rate in the United States is 
37 percent, mm -hmm. something like yeah, that. Right around there. Seven point something. Yeah. They, well, that's fe federal. Federal. Right? Federal. Right. Federal right. top marginal tax rate. Right. Yeah. Um, and it used to be, you know, 70 percent before um, Reagan had it moved to practically half last year, traditionally lower than half, and, you know, and 90 percent under Eisenhower. Um, and but there are and how much of that was actually paid by people because there were always loopholes in things like the tax system and that sort of thing. But there are various various different theorists have different ideas about well where would that top limit be such that we could keep getting more more in such that we wouldn't be so much diminishing the motivation of people to work that we would still get more revenue. And estimates vary from like as high as eighty three percent, seventy percent, I've seen various different papers um, offering various different amounts on that. Um, but a lot higher than what we do now. Which is not surprising given that when Reagan cut taxes basically in half and promised that it would pay for itself, the deficit exploded. It didn't pay for itself. It wasn't that, you know, it wasn't, it, it didn't seem like you know, it, that the idea was that it was already too high then and it just didn't look like it was too high. None of these tax cuts are actually paid for themselves as they have always been portrayed by some in those circles as saying that they would just actually get more revenue. Okay, thank you for, I think, uh, we'll go to you now, Rob. Not to me, uh, back to these two. Back um, to these two? Okay. Yeah. Could we ask each of you to uh, share one thing you take away from the other side and one final big thought you would leave with us? So the main thing I take away from Scott is I really should have reviewed the evidence on the effect of inequality on national outcomes before I came here. Actually, I spent most of the time uh, reading up on something that we didn't even talk about, which was whether the Nazis were socialists. <laughs> but uh, it, turned out, it turned out that that didn't, wasn't, it didn't arise, so unfortunate. Um, so there was a time when I was more versed in literature. Um, he showed you a, one or two papers, or really it was one, one of his uh, a couple of books. So there are hundreds of papers on this. I don't think that he's showing you a representative sample of what's actually been done. And the claim that inequality is actually better for these outcomes is much disputed even among people that are sympathetic to the claim. So uh, there is uh, that. In terms of what I'd really like you to take away, uh, the main thing is don't think of capitalism as the status quo and socialism as improving the status quo. Right? Rather, you know, it is much more helpful to think about the status quo is something that in the United States is relatively capitalist compared to most other countries in the world, but it is, in fact, in absolute terms, quite socialist. Government plays a very large role in labor markets, a very large role in housing markets, very large role in redistribution, very large role in energy and education and healthcare. Right? Uh, now, in all of these cases, I say if you really look at what government does, there is the propaganda about being nice and making things nice for people, and then there's the reality, which is burning piles of resources and mostly in counterproductive ways. Uh, I've got a book that I'm about halfway done with called Unbeatable, The Brutally Honest Case for Free Markets, uh, where I explore these themes in a lot of depth. Uh, the main slogan, just to get you to pre-order when it becomes available, is you know, capitalism does the good stuff that sounds bad, and socialism does the bad stuff that sounds good. Or really, I government does the bad stuff that sounds good, and socialism being government on steroids. So we're right there. Thanks a lot. Thank So one thing that I want to take away from Brian's presentation, not that this surprised me, I know some of his positions. Um, I, I like the fact that he's so willing to take the position on integration that he does. Um, I mean, it's, it's a counter example to a sort of tendency that we see in a lot of people in the political spectrum here of you're either right or you're left. And the traditional right position, not, yeah, not the traditional right position, but the recent right position is to be very much against immigration and to be, you know, make that the scapegoat for, for everything here. And I certainly appreciate the fact that he is, is not doing that, because I mostly agree with those points as far as that goes. Um, it sort of, so it's to some extent a side issue, but I appreciate that. The thing I would have you take away, I'll just actually step away from the, the data and about which one to choose and just say that I'd hope that you take away that there is reasoning to be done here, that there are arguments to be made, um, that there are there's data to be looked at, um, and judgment to be employed 
in our hyper-polarized political world, we tend to forget that. We just tend to parrot the lines of our chosen camp um, and don't bother to actually think about these issues. Um, and I think there's a lot of thinking to be done and that it's productive and that we can hopefully come to better conclusions. And I hope that that's part of the point of an education here. Thank you. Thank you both very much. You were exceptionally well prepared and uh, you responded to each other's arguments uh, as Thank nicely as we've ever seen in this form. There aren't a lot of things like this going on in the world, so much appreciated. Yeah, very much. Thanks to everyone who showed up, actually. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's very flattering that you would take time on the list of the Rangers game. That yes, sir. <laughs> Two uh, Texas teams. <laughs> uh, all right, just loyalty. Yeah. All right, thanks, everybody. <clears throat>